Who are you listening to? When the Apostle Paul was in prison and he's facing a hard time and uh, he wrote some of his most amazing letters um, and 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus are three letters that he wrote to Tim and Titus who were like his sons in the faith and uh, the second letter we're going to handle in the next couple of Sunday mornings um, but if you really want to understand how God worked in this man's life and his heart and passion, particularly as he's getting ready to meet the Lord because he knows that his days are numbered, that Nero has his number and uh, Nero was the Roman emperor who unleashed the first uh, persecution against the church and he was an evil man, terrible man and he ended up being murdered by his own bodyguard. They got rid of him. But um, um, Paul knew that his days were numbered. And so these final letters, they're poignant, they're, they're passionate, they share his heart. And uh, I think it's good to read them in different translations. So for this series, I've just been reading them in the New King James Version, the NIV, the New Living Translation, the message, just to get the feel of what he's saying. And there's so much we can, we can talk about. In fact, they're not systematic or organised. They're all over the place, actually. He gets one thought here, then he repeats himself a little bit later because he's just sharing uh, what he feels and what's most important for Timothy, who was the pastor of the largest church that Paul pioneered in, in the city of Ephesus, which is uh, on the coast of Turkey. And um, you can go there. They've actually dug the city up. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. I'm pretty sure of that. Rome, Alexandria, Ephesus, probably had three to 400,000 people. It was a major commercial centre uh, for trade, had a huge harbour. Uh, it was a religious uh, city. Uh, it was the centre for the worship of Diana, or in the Greek, Artemis. Um, and so it was a very religious and, um, uh, community. And so Timothy's there, and he's a young guy, and Paul's sharing his heart. And um, what I'm focusing on today, last week we talked about are we just religious or are we living authentically as Christ followers? It's easy to slip into a religious mindset and, and uh, when you've been around for a while and, you know, we worship on a Sunday and we sing beautiful songs like we have and melts our hearts, uh, we share together, but then Monday comes around very quickly and then Tuesday night and Wednesday and it's easy to be religious, to have, and in fact, he says this in the second letter, you can have a form of godliness, but deny the power. Right. You can have the form of religion, but not the reality of the life of Christ through the Holy Spirit uh, working in you. So I shared about, are we merely religious or do we live authentically? And you can get the message on our TV station. We have one, don't we? On YouTube. Um, today, I want to focus on, are we self-taught or are we God-taught? Who's our authority? Um, do we teach ourselves? Am I the centre of the universe? Am I my own God? Am I my own source of revelation? You know, uh, the Jesus that I serve is created in my own image. I like this part of Jesus. I don't understand that part. I like that part. And, and people today have all kinds of strange notions and views, even Christians <laughs> within the church. And you think, wow, where do you get that from? It's, it's, uh, that view is not centred on Scripture, on an understanding of the Old Testament and New Testament, or, or centred around the person of Jesus, because the whole Old Testament points to Christ. The whole New Testament explains Christ. And so to be a, a New Testament Christian is to be rooted and grounded in Scripture. And I don't mean just taking scriptures out of context. And I shared a bit last week how some people take scriptures out of context to create a doctrine, like the doctrine that says, you know, a strange views of that, you know, women are second-class citizens. And they shouldn't be involved in leadership or ministry or preaching because they take a couple of isolated passages with a unique context but miss the whole flow of the scripture. And I kind of debunked that a bit last week. Um, and so uh, we've got to make sure that Scripture interprets Scripture, that we get a good view of what God, what God is like, what he says, by understanding the Old and New Testament. That's why in, in all of our preaching pretty well, you won't find a message from this pulpit 
in all of our service where we're not looking at Scripture and trying to interpret Scripture correctly, the right rules of engagement, and, and also that everything centres around the person of Jesus and um, who he is and what he's done and what he's continuing to do in heaven by the giving of the gift of the Spirit uh, in our lives. And so uh, unless we've got to be biblically grounded and Christ-centred. And also it shows itself in, in loving people. In other words, always choosing the highest good of other people. If, if we're about my good or my gain, that's not New Testament Christianity. And Paul says to Timothy, I'll use, I'll use my language, he says, these rat bags that are there, get rid of them. They're indulgent, they're creepy, it's all about themselves, they want money, they want power, get rid of them. He's pretty tough, actually. He says, these guys that are just out to rip off people, are con men who use religion to gain, to, 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 to rip people's finances off them and all that stuff. So he's pretty rugged on, 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 to Timothy. He says, Timothy, just deal with these people because they're heretics, they're crooked. Uh, they're not, they don't really love people. They're not adding value to people's lives. And so you can tell what's authentic is uh, whether a New Testament ministry is, is what's in the best interest of people, even people who we don't like, even people who are our enemies, even people who don't believe the same things we believe. How do we treat them? We must treat them as Jesus would. We don't have to agree with everyone, but we're called to be the best lovers in all the world and to love our enemies and to do good to those who despitefully use us. And that's pretty hard when somebody abuses you and uses you because you want to pay back. But the, the Lord's taken the sword of vengeance out of our hearts and he says, you've got to bless them. If they curse you, bless them. So that's, Paul is saying to Timothy, stick with the basics, son. Don't be moved by these Johnny-come-latelys. Don't, don't be with their strange ideas or don't be moved by these philosophers who have this idea and think they're going to reinterpret who Jesus is and have another authority outside the scriptures. And so don't be self-taught, uh, be God-taught. And, and he had some really good, Timothy had some really good models. Uh, he was influenced by a godly family and by a godly pastor. And he had a terrific mum in Eunice and a grandma called Lois, and Paul actually lists them and says, these are magnificent women. And they brought up this little boy uh, who somehow didn't have a dad. We don't know about his Greek dad. We don't think he died because they would have mentioned it. It just seems like he's produced this boy, then he took off. And so like, there's no mention of him. So, uh, um, so Timothy grew up in, in, a, in a female household. So his mum and grandma were mum and dad to him. And there's a little bit of imbalance in his responses. There seems to have been some fears, insecurities, a uh, sense of inadequacy that gripped this little kid. And so he carried it on into adulthood. And Paul writes to him in, in the second letter. He says, son, don't, don't you give in to fear. Don't you give in to a cringing sense of inferiority. He goes, you're not defined by your past. He goes, you, you, you are defined by who you now are. For God has not given you a spirit of fear cringing fear and timidity. He's giving you a spirit of power, of love, and self-control. Self-control. You're not going to be out of control. Your dad was out of control. Yeah, he may have been a drunkard. He may have been a womanizer. He may have, you know, beaten his, your mum up. And, but that's not going to come through to you. God's given you power through the Holy Spirit. He's given you all the love you need through the Holy Spirit. He's given you all the self-control and mental soundness. You're not going to go crazy. Or maybe his dad went crazy. Maybe there was a mental health issue. We don't know. We know nothing. He's just nameless. The nameless Greek, father of Timothy. But there were consequences in his life. So, so Timothy was deeply influenced by these two magnificent women in his life and also by his pastor, Paul. And they shaped his life and they promoted his spiritual growth. And you know what? We need good role models. If you haven't had good, ro good role models in life, the church of Jesus Christ, the Christian Family Centre. We've got fantastic role models here in this place. And if, if your dad was a louse or your mum was not very sound in areas, you've got to love them, you've got to forgive them, but there's some great mums and great dads and great brothers and great sisters here that you can learn from, that you can, you can model yourself on. And, uh, you know, we mentioned Pastor Ian Hunter, and I just went up to Ian before and just thanked him. Ian was 
probably my closest ministry associate for 20 years, you know, working, we went to Bible college together in the early 70s, and now he's sort of, he's not retired, he's just not on paid staff, but he does so much stuff. But you look at him, what a role model, as a husband, as a father, magnificent. And I know Kathy and I, because he's a lot older than me, we would look at him and, <laughs> and say, you know. <laughs> well, the half German, half Russian, George Wabnitz. I mean, Kathy and I say, George, how do you do it? How do you raise these good kids? And he would give us his Germanic, Teutonic, Russian wisdom in his own way. But there were some great thoughts there. And I needed role models. My dad was a fantastic dad. Mum was a fantastic mum. But in many respects, we raised ourselves up because they were working so hard as, as immigrants. And I mean, like, uh, and so um, we got out of control, my sisters and I, in some areas. And so, uh, so I've, I've, needed, I've needed the church. I've needed men and women in my life who have been fantastic role models. You know, my Kathy, you read her story, a little bit of her story in chapter three of my book, The Me I Can Be. How, you know, her dad died in her heart when she was 11, 12 years of age, even though he physically died 20 years later. So her image of men was just a shocker. But it was the men at the door. Men like the silver fox. Remember him? Mr. Highland? Len Thompson? You know, Keith Redmond? Beautiful men that were just little things. I never knew that. You know, they, they would just put their arm around Kathy and say, how you doing, you know, you're fantastic. It's just little statements. And, and Kathy, years later, said, that did more for her than all my sermons. <laughs> just to encourage me, she said that, just to encourage me. Like, yeah, great, thanks, sweetheart. <laughs> but you see, role models who emulate goodness and kindness and love, we need that. And some of you fellas, you, 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 you need men in your life that can recalibrate you. To, to be thinking correctly, to act rightly, because your thinking's not right. Your, your behaviour's not correct. And God doesn't condemn you. He just says, hey, we've got people in the church that you can model yourself after. Talk with them. How do you, how do you deal with this? How do, you oper how do you raise kids? How do you maintain purity? How do you ensure that you live an honest life? And so Paul was able to pour his heart out to Timothy and Titus. And in the midst of sharing with him about how to govern the church and how to lead, he shares some beautiful statements about life and relationships. And, uh, and this statement here, he says, train yourself, son, 1 Timothy 4, 7, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Man, I mean, Paul was a, a, an avid sportsman. I mean, if he was here now, he would want to go up to, to Johan and say, I'm coming on breakfast, I want to know about cricket. What's this crazy game cricket? You know, like, he was into sports, you know, athletics, and, and he uses a lot of sporting analogies. And um, so, look, physical exercise is important. It's good. I've shed 12 kilos in the last three months. None of you have noticed, I've known. <laughs> but it's all gone off my arms and legs and this medicine ball is still there. So I've got to lose another 12. Oh, that's hard. Hey, lose it when you're in your 30s, not your 60s. That's a word of wisdom from an old man. It's harder. Hey, it's great. You know, I've got my walking machine. I've got the river torrents that I walk through. I've got my weights, you know. And, and uh, look, I can do it every day for hours. But when I stand in front of the mirror, I think I'm seeing a 30-year-old Greek, godlike body. Hey, you'll never get back. You old boys, you'll never get back to looking like you're in your 30s. You girls, you'll never look like when you're in your 20s or 30s. You have a bunch of kids and, and your body gets wrecked. It's just the reality. Fellas, it's just... But it's helpful. It's helpful. He says it's good to do it. He goes, but the greatest thing is, is train yourself to be godly exercise, practice it, because this has not just a, a human natural value, but value for eternity. It's better in all directions, both for the present and the life to come. Its range is greater. 
It produces the best life in the here and now, and it prepares us for eternal life in heaven. Hallelujah. That's where Max and Lynn are in heaven. What a terrible way to, to, to get there with a shocking accident. Just an accident, Port Wakefield Road. Just like, what? But they're in heaven. And, uh, and we, we trust that, that Thursday when Ian leads the service and all their friends and family are there, there's going to be a time to say, you know what? We're saddened, but we don't grieve like people who don't have hope. We have a living hope. Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. And these guys are alive. They're just in heaven. They just can't live here on earth. And body and soul will come together when Christ consummates all things at the end of time. So, uh, you know, godliness enables us to believe rightly, to participate in church uh, actively and to minister to one another lovingly. And as Paul instructed Timothy, we also are to preserve the Christian faith by teaching sound doctrine. And that just means teaching the right things. Doctrine is just the right things to believe. And by modelling right living. And this is what he says to, to Timothy. So how do we... Question, so how do I train myself to be godly? So I've just looked at the letter and I just found a couple of things. Well, this is interesting how he... The issues that they were facing back in Ephesus, they're not the same as the issues that we face here now, but there, there's some... There's some correlations there. So he says, flee from false beliefs and wrong practices. That's the first thing. But you, a man of God, flee from all this stuff. Recognize the wrong things. Recognize the wrong things. And there were a couple of wrong things in, in, in that era. One of it was uh, unnatural asceticism. And you read it in the letter there. And uh, you might say, what the heck is asceticism? Well, just read this. The Holy Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, the latter times are the times between the resurrection of Christ and his ascension and when he comes back. So this is the, this is, these are the last days, the latter times. So it's confusing to think, oh, well, that means last days, only got a short time. No, it's been 2,000 years. It may be another 2,000 years, or it could be two years before he returns. We don't know. But uh, in the latter times, the Spirit says, some will abandon the faith, turn from the Christian faith, turn from belief in the old and... New Testament scriptures and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons what? they're listening to other voices they've got passengers sitting on their shoulders speaking to them ideas oh that's a good idea not recognising it comes from hell because ideas that come from hell usually go against scripture they turn your eyes off Jesus and they're hurtful towards people you can tell if it's an idea from hell. Ideas from heaven are rooted in scripture, centered around Christ, and always add value to people's lives. And so such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared. In fact, the Greek word is the word cauterized. It's like, they're cauterized. They can't even, like with a hot iron, it's like they're not even sensible now. The demons and the who speak the evil philosophies and evil ideas are predominating through them. And in that era, there were the, the, the people who, I call them, the soul is good, the body is evil brigade. Like this, there were people that actually believed that anything to do with the soul, spirit, was good. Anything to do with the body was evil. And so, uh, and they're in the church. And so you remember in Ephesus, I mean, it's a licentious city. Either they're... So these people came out of terrible immorality and some of them as they came into the faith were influenced by Greek philosophers because the Greek city. So they go to the other extreme and say, oh, well, therefore sex is bad, marriage is wrong, don't have kids. Like, eh? Where'd you get that from? Who, whose voice are you listening to? It's like from one extreme to the other. So they're listening to demons when they're worshipping Artemis and now they're listening to demons to go the other extreme. And so Paul says, these guys, he goes, they forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving because it's consecrated by the word of God and prayer. In other words, if it's, it's lined with scripture and we're dependent on him. So they refuse, these people... And uh, the technical term 
you can check this out, they, they were called docetists, D-O-C-E-T, docetism is this philosophy, an idea that somehow Jesus, when he came to earth, they believed this, was not really, the eternal son did not really become a human being. It seemed like he was a human being because the, their thinking was that the God of creation cannot make contact with the physical world because he's so perfect, he's so good, that if he made contact with the physical world, it would soil him, it would corrupt him. And so the notion that God came down and became a miserable, horrible, evil human being with a body, yuck. You see, that's the philosophy, it's called docetism. And it, it, it was a creepy philosophy. Later on in the second century, third century, uh, it became more sophisticated by a guy called Mani. He was a Persian philosopher. And uh, we, get, we would get Manichaeanism. And Manichaeanism says, you know, black, white, dualism. And so that everything of physical is evil, everything of, of spiritual is good. So that's where it infected the church. So that's where celibacy came in. So, you know, where, where monks would commit themselves, and there's nothing wrong with being celibate, nothing wrong with, with choosing to live a single life. That's, that's wonderful for people. But where it's ordered to say that's a more spiritual life, then that's wrong and false. And so these notions crept in. And where do they come from? They're doctrines from demons, people listening, and they've got an idea. But the idea is contrary to what Scripture teaches. And uh, Paul debunks this, or abstaining from certain foods. I mean, like, give me a like, God could have made eating boring. Imagine, like he could have put a funnel on top of our heads and you just throw in the potatoes and, and the carrots and, and just stick it in there, because all it is is fuel. I mean, you've got to see it once it's in the stomach in duodenum. It doesn't look very pretty at all. Like, you know, the dishes that, that my wife produces, they're just a work of art. But an hour later, if you got a, had a look in my tummy, you think, yuck. <laughs> it's a factory. And it breaks it all down, and there's all these enzymes going, and, and, and you know, like, and, and it breaks down in, into proteins and fats and lippy acids and, and, and all the good stuff, and then the bad stuff gets excreted out. We won't talk about that. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> he could have made eating boring. But eating is fantastic. We love eating. And we love sitting down and talking as we're eating. Okay, so God made it. You know, producing children could have been really boring. Let's just hold fingers. Bang. Okay. Child produced. Could have been boring. Oh, but God made it so pleasurable. Isn't it great? Oh, okay, I better be careful what I'm saying. It's, God is a good God. He creates pleasure. He creates art. And, and he makes these things for our enjoyment. Why? Because the physical body is good. Every jolly part of your body is good. The evil dimension is desire, where we have sinned and we turn our backs on God. And so food can become a master and it can kill you. You can eat yourself to death. Sex can kill you. I mentioned last week, you know, they're around Australia, they're trying to change the prostitution laws. And I wish they would. But to follow the Scandinavian model, to say, you know what? Let's decriminalise the offence against the girls, because most of them are drug addicts or sexually abused, and criminalise the men who visit them. It's cut the prostitution in the Scandinavian countries like you've got to believe. That's a great answer. And all the men will love it. Not those who visit. So, so, you see, what is that? It's a perversion. What is good? Sexual intimacy, good. For it to become mechanical, machine-like, where women are just like, what? It, it's, it's, so, so we know that's human evil desire, contrary to the guidelines of God's word and, 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 and not adding value to people's lives. So Paul is saying here, hey, those who forbid to marry and those who have stayed... I said, don't listen to them. Today. You say, what's the relevance of today? Do you know the, the extreme environmental lobby? Okay, the extreme environmental lobby. They're listening to demons. They're listening to demons. 
That little girl, that 15-year-old girl that spoke at the United Nations, did you hear behind her voice, we will never forgive you? It's like a curse upon people. Where would that come from? We will never forgive you. How dare you? I mean, wow. Everyone's going, oh, what? no, no, no. We love, we've got to forgive. We've got to, it's like this nasty kind of spirit that came through her. And, uh, uh, and for me, I've been an environmentalist all my life, before I was a Christian. I wanted to be a zoologist. I loved animals. I can't stand our environment being polluted and destroyed, our oceans, trees, and all that stuff. And there's a practical problem. We don't know exactly, for those of you who are scientists and research it a bit, hey, there's no question the climate changes. It's always changed. The question is, how much has man interfered with it? through the industrial, and we're not too sure. So people say, are you for the chain? I think, yeah, why? Well, I just like having an insurance policy. That could be wrong. That could be wrong. But let's take out an insurance policy. That's fine. And, and to think that human beings are not going to solve the problem, we're made in God's image. We've solved every problem that's come our way. As if we're not going to be able to solve the climate issue? Of course we are and to sow fear into kids' minds so they're hysterical. And this is what they actually say. The lobby, the extinction group, is let's not marry now. This is they're teaching this to kids. Let's not marry and have children because the world is going to end soon due to climate change and global warming because we're not fixing it up. Like, wow, that's it. That's it. Where'd that doctrine come from? There's truth in it. We've got to solve it. But to say, we're not going to have any kids. And it's almost like if you choose to have Three or four children. I've had four. I would have had five, but Kathy went on strike, and and uh, after four, and uh, so well, you, having one is right, but having three, you're selfish, and pressure being put on people. Hey, God loves kids. God loves marriage. God loves this earth. So there's this crazy notion, or the the, the more that's that's one that's happening now, or the gender fluidity philosophy. Who would have thought that would have taken root? <laughs> Male and female gender is not a biological reality, but a social construct. They're against the binary male-female distinction. So there's something like 30 different definitions of, of who we are. It's like, what? That was, sometimes there are, there are problems, there are practical problems. And little babies that are born and, and where they can't tell if it's a male or female. That's, that's a, if, if, what they do is they check out the chromosomes. You either got an X or a Y or an XY. You're either male or female genetically. And then the surgeons with the parents can actually work out and do the operation and say, well, that's a little girl, actually. No, it's a little boy. So that is the reality. That there, there are that, that kind of physical problems that take place. But now to say, you know, like little kids can say, well, you know, don't call him a little boy. Don't call him a little girl. Let him make up his own mind whether he wants to be a girl or a boy. Where did that come from? That's a doctrine of a demon. Listening and, 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 just, and, and it's totally contrary, notice, to the Genesis 1, 2 and 3. God made men and women in his own image. So what it is, is see, demonic power turns us against the scripture. It violates and it's not in the best interest of people. And to have courts of law across the world, certain jurisdictions, to give seven-year-old kids, eight-year-old kids to have puberty blockers? Parents guiding their kids to say they cannot develop normally and you block them? And they don't know whether those things cause cancer or other kinds of illness? That's nutsville. If they have to go that way, at least the child should be 18 years of age. It should be a legal adult if they want to do it. Well, OK, you're not going to stop them. But it's, it's to me, this child abuse. It, it's abusing children. Children don't, can't make those decisions. And, and so, but the philosophy is, oh, you know, the kid put on a dress, so therefore it must be a little girl. Or the girl, you know, is a bit of a tomboy. So what? My mum used to dress me as a little girl up until I was two years of age. Because she <laughs> I had long, beautiful blonde hair because we had two older sisters. And, and uh, people do funny things, you know, like... That's just normal, that's just growing up and some little kids. So what I'm saying here is the gender fluidity philosophy, you need to look at it because teachers, you know in the school sector, there's pressure being put on that, you know, to change per personal pronouns and all that kind of stuff so that there's confusion. And if there's confusion in the hearts and minds of our little kids, we're going to destroy them. We're going to create huge anxiety uh, over climate issue, huge anxiety. 
and that causes mental illnesses. And little kids should not have to be carrying all that weight. It's an adult problem and the adults need to fix it. And then secondly, confusion of who are they, a little boy, a little girl, is, is another area of, of terror. And th these are doctrines of demons that operate today, just like back in, in that era. I'm not saying that people aren't sincere that they believe it, but they're believing anything. They're believing stuff that's just wacko and weird. And, and how do we define that? Because we say our authority is scripture, the person of Jesus and what's in the best interest of people. So, so that was unnatural asceticism. Also greedy materialism operated in, in that church. Um, have a look at these scriptures. And I'm jumping to chapter, chapter 6 now. I've just read chapter 4, those uh, first five verses or so. Look at chapter 6. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in every envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed, look at this, these people, he now nails it, have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Hey, you had prosperity gospelers back in that era. He said, you come to Christ and you automatically will become wealthy and healthy. They were there. And Paul says, well, that's a heresy. That's wacko stuff. Now, I believe that the person who comes to Christ, like for example, you know, if you were a smoker, a gambler, a drinker, you might be spending 200 bucks a week. That's not a lot. That could be up to 300 bucks a week on smokes, gambling, and things. You save that, or give 10% to Jesus and save the rest, you'll buy a second house and a third house within 10 years. So naturally, by building proper habits in, there is, there is this what we call redemption lift, the phenomena. Sociologists call it redemption lift. So, so any society that, that actually takes the ethics of Jesus and, and outworks redemption, they get, there's a social lifting out. Well, it's, it's common sense. Okay, and so, so that happens. And so that's not the prosperity gospel. That's just the work of the spirit to lift us out and we build good habits in. And, uh, you know, people say to me, oh, they used to say, well, you know, you give 10% of your income to the church. Oh, isn't that a lot? I say, man, I used to give the devil a lot more. <laughs> I mean, my smokes, a packet a day, you work what that costs. My drinking, my gambling, like wasteful. Um, so, but materialism was there in Paul's day. And he says, a greedy materialism. And it is not saying that God's against you having nice things. And he's not saying that at all. But he's saying where your obsession is that, that you are just, your God is materialism because you love the physical so much you're missing the spiritual. The spiritual made the physical. So when you don't have the spiritual, all what you have is the physical and they can control you. They can control you and you live for this. And he says... But godliness with contentment is great gain. I love that. Isn't that good? Godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. He's not saying money is evil. Money is neutral. We need money. It's, it's neutral. You, you use it for good, you, use it, you can use it for evil. Because some people, eager for money, the lust for it, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And I've seen this in, in, in the church. And, and seen it with people that are chasing after materialism. And it's like, well, you can gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, what happens to you? Um, there are preachers today, thankfully, like we had one in one of our national conferences and we sent an invitation to him and a great speaker, terrific speaker. I didn't really know him, but uh, I've met him once, international guy. And so uh, we sent an invitation. I think Peter remembers this one. <laughs> and we get a letter back from his secretary saying, well, he charges about at least a minimum of $10,000 for a 30-minute message. 
That's just minimum. You'd probably go up to 15, 20 would be more likely. You know, like if you're wanting for four sessions, you, you're talking about, you know, you've got, you got to put in 50, 60 grand. So, the so we invited him and we, we quickly uninvited him. All of our guest speakers, wonderful men and women of God, never have asked for a cent. And we want to bless them and, and be liberal and, and be generous to them. Uh, in all my years in, in, in Christian ministry, 48 years, I've never asked for a cent from any church, including our church. Never. So I go, I, I travel a lot, and they, they, they say, well, how much do you charge? I say, I don't charge anything. Well, can we give you anything? No, you don't have to give me anything. So I'll cover my own airfares and stuff. And so some of them want to give. And, uh, and so I say, look, you don't have to. And when they do, you know what happens? My wife takes it. <laughs> I'll never even see it. I get pocket money. I get pocket money. I'm 60. I get pocket money from her. All right. I'm the head of my home. And she gives me pocket money. So I say, sweetheart, you do with it what you want. I said, do you use it for travel? You can travel with me. And usually she gives it to missions anyway. So, I mean, it's like... But, so they were there in Paul's day. And, uh, and materialism can grip you. It will grip you if you're not firmly grounded in your relationship with Jesus. Because if you're not satisfied with him and you're getting nourishment and strength from his word, you're going to fill that gap with something. And that's where the, the lust after things is what drives people. And that, that's terrible and it's destructive. And there's nothing wrong with having a nice house and having a nice car. Okay? Nothing wrong with having... Well, I don't know if they're nice clothes. Kathy just bring, puts them out and says, you're wearing this today. Because if, if I had my way, I'd be dressed like a bum. Anyway, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. But your conscience has to be clear that you are, you love Jesus, you're aligned to his word, and you're wanting to, to be a good role model to people as well. You, 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 you don't want to live an ostentatious life. And, and, and look, you can be a very wealthy person and be a very generous person. You can be a very poor person and be stingy as can be. One of the wealthiest men in Australia is a born-again Christian, loves the Lord. His name is Andrew Forrest, Twiggy Forrest. He runs Fortescue, Fortescue Mining, worth about, I think, five or six billion dollars. Do you know all of his money, billions of dollars, put into a trust. He's following Bill Gates' example. Bill Gates is a Catholic. He and his wife is stronger. Bill kind of follows Melinda. Melinda. I mean, they've, they've put 60 billion dollars into the Gates Foundation. It's just amazing. And Warren Buffett's done the same thing. He's got about 60 billion and, and Twiggy Forrest. I mean, so extremely, so these people are centred. They're centred around Jesus. They're centred around doing good to people. And so money's not the most important thing in, in the world to them. They use it for good purposes. So you can be rich and generous, or you can be rich and stingy, or you can be poor and generous, or poor and stingy. So, Paul, so materialism... Can, can, uh, uh, can grip you. And he says, look, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, every one of you here is rich. Every one of you. People say, oh, I, I understand the poverty level and people are below poverty and they're trying to lift the, the support and, and, and I'm all for that. But you think that's poverty? Come to Ghana with me with a fisherman on the Gold Coast area and their families live on $2 a day. $2 a day. Wow. And those fishermen who come to Christ, they tithe. 10% <laughs> of that. Hit of the church. No electricity. They've got to get the water from the river. I mean, it's a really rural area. Two bucks a day, that's how much a year? About 800 bucks a year. The average wage in Australia is, I think, about what, $1,100 a week or something, isn't it? So in one week we earn more than... So nobody is in poverty in Australia when you compare. There is the poverty of self-induced poverty. There are people who... Kids that are in poverty because parents are addicts and, and uh, alcoholics and all that stuff. And, and so that's why those children need support, whether from our government services, churches, other groups. But he's saying here, you're rich. Christian Family Centre, Aussies... <laughs> In this present world, 
Don't be arrogant about it, but put your hope, don't put your hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Wow, isn't that good? So who are you listening to? Are you just self-taught and open to all kinds of ideas and thinking and doctrines of demons? Or are you God-taught? You've got to flee. He says, if you, if you want to be godly, train yourself to be godly, you've got to flee from false beliefs and wrong practices and be attuned to those things from culture and society that go against Scripture, that take our eyes off Jesus, that is hurtful towards people. Then he goes on to say, pursue what is right and true. He says, but you, man of God, woman of God, flee from all this and pursue what? Righteousness. Your right standing with God, pursue, delve into what it means to have a right standing with God and then how to live rightly with God and with others. And that's what godliness is about. Faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Last week I shared on this about what Paul says to Timothy, hey, be an example in your speech, your conduct, your love, your faith, your purity. So we've got to choose to embrace the correct things. We've got to recognise the wrong things and reject them, but choose to embrace the correct things, to be active. And then he says, fight for the faith. I love this. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your confession in the presence of many witnesses. Timothy, guard what's been entrusted to your care. Turn away from the godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. It's kind of an early form of Gnosticism. The Greek word gnosis is, is like salvation through knowledge rather than salvation through Jesus who died on a cross for our sins and rose again. He says, deal with that stuff. But notice, I love this. He uses active verbs here. He uses forceful verbs, doing words. That's what a verb is. Remember, a noun is different between a verb and an you know, adverb and all that stuff. You want a grammar lesson? Verbs are doing words, action words. And, and notice that he says, it's like flee, pursue, fight, take hold, guard, turn away. Christianity, folks, is not a passive religion where you just wait for God to do it all. He has done everything possible to save you. He sent Jesus, fully God, fully man, lived a perfect life on your behalf. And his obedience has been credited to you in your disobedience. So God doesn't wait for you to be obedient before he saves you. He says, you're a disobedient brat, but I love you. Because you're not good, you're bad. If you think you can get to heaven by you being good, you can't. Only bad people get to heaven who acknowledge their badness, who confess their sins and say, Jesus, thank you for living a perfect life for me. Your obedience has been credited to me. And then his death on the cross, a vicarious death. Vicarious means in our place. It should have been me dying for my own sins. But he died in my place. So he carried all my sins, past, present and future, upon himself. Don't understand it. I can't, I, can't, I can't, I don't get it, but I accept it. You can never fully grasp and understand what happened at the cross where you see God's love showing itself. It's the prism of God's love as a man is hung there between heaven and earth and he's a God, he's God in human form and he carries your sin and my sin. And he says, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Cancels out our debt. And he rises from the dead, goes back to heaven, sends the Holy Spirit, and now we have a gospel of forgiveness and grace and eternal life and the gift of the Holy Spirit, help for today through the Holy Spirit and eternal hope for all our tomorrows through Jesus Christ. He's done that for us. And when he went to heaven, he didn't say, well, I'm going to stay there, you're on your own now. He sent the Holy Spirit. He says, I'm going to come to you again. The people who read those scriptures in John and say, I'm going to come to you again, think there's a second coming. No, it's the coming of the Spirit. Because I'm with you, but he's going to be in you. You know of him, but he's going to live in you. So we've got Jesus on the inside. Wow. Isn't that something? So God has done all that. But he says here, Tim, he goes, now you've got to be activist. You've got to train yourself to be godly. 
This magnificent cricketer that's going to share next week, his body doesn't look like that by him being a slouch. <laughs> Food, sleep, drink, and being lazy. You've got to work. You've got to train. You've got to get that fat off. You've got to get the muscles going. It's like training, training, training. And he says, that profits you in the natural. He goes, you've got to do the same spiritually. You've got to do it. That's why he says, here, flee. Identify the things that are false. Get rid of them. Pursue these things. Fight the good fight. Take hold. Claim the benefits of eternal life now in this life. Claim them. Don't be passive. Be an activist. Christ followers are activists. In their faith, we obey Jesus with courage and we always choose what we know is right. We don't deliberately choose what we know is wrong. We don't wait, we get going. We're moving. So you've got to train yourself to be godly. And this is what he says to Timothy. It's not going to fall out of heaven. God's provided what he's provided. Now you've got to rise up and say, okay, I'm going to take hold of it. And the athletic illustration is, 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 is the right one that, he's, that he uses here. And finally... How do, you, how do you train yourself to be godly? Well, just practice liberality as a lifestyle. That's, that's what God is like. He is just liberal. He is generous. He is just a giving, loving machine, if we can say that. He just cannot help but love and give and share. God's a happy God. He's not miserable. He's happy. He sings. He rejoices. Creates colour, beauty. It creates laughter. Oh, we need to laugh more. Follow the example of your grandkids or your kids. They just laugh all the time. They laugh over nothing. And we just are so miserable and serious. <laughs> Learn to laugh. Learn to see the funny side of life. You have my permission to tease people. Tease them in the right way. I'm a terrible teaser. My kids, grandkids don't know if I'm serious or... or and, and, and the trouble is they came back to me and said, but we don't believe anything you tell us. Because <laughs> we don't know whether you're serious or not serious. So you've got to be careful on that one. You know, like... The kids are funny. My little grandson, the, the, the two of them, the two boys, Nicky's little boys, we're having breakfast and, and they said, you know, they go, what's a Christian, Bubble? I'm having breakfast. I'm not going to get into a deep spiritual conversation. What's a Christian bubble? What do you say to a six-year-old and a, and a seven-year-old? Okay, that got me. I thought, a Christian follows Christ, and so we, we love Jesus and we love people. And Josiah goes, yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> Vasily, he goes, I'm half a Christian. The loving Jesus part is right, but the loving people part, uh, that's the part he's like. <laughs> well, yesterday, I had him yesterday morning for our, our Saturday morning omelette. I make the best omelette in the world. Now you love it. They come, bub, give us an omelette. Right? So I so, said, okay, we're all there, the three of them. Now, we're going to say prayers. And they've got their fork in there. I put that fork down. Are we Christians or barbarians? Little Vasily goes, I'm a barbarian. <laughs> Grab the fork. <laughs> So they, they just, they just, but you've got to have a sense of humour. They're so funny and they're so quick. Oh, you learn from them. So liberality in your laughter, in your joy, with your money, with your kindness, with your, your, your lifestyle. And, and Paul says here to, to these guys, he goes, and I read this before, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them, look at this, to do good. Even if you don't have a lot of material wealth, you can be rich in good deeds. Command them to do good and to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. No matter how poor you are, it's not based on how much you have. It's an attitude that you are to share your life, your love, your house, your goods, 
your time, your energy, your interest with other people. This is, this is, and develop that as a habit. That's how you become godly. That's what God is like. God is like that. His sun shines on the just and the unjust. His rain falls on the just and the unjust. He doesn't say, well, that, that farmer, I don't like what he did the other day. Uh, cloud, don't, don't pour it on his, go on the other one. No, God doesn't do that. He's kind towards everyone. So that's how we train ourselves to be godly. Let's stand together. I'd like to pray with you. Okay. Are you ready to embrace a new exercise regime? Yes. I want to hear a yes. I want to train myself to be godly. Three people are with me. <laughs> Train yourself to be godly. And uh, listen to, read these letters again. And, and, and ask God to help you to see what he's saying to this beautiful young man. God will speak to you and he will encourage you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your wonderful presence through the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we can call you our loving heavenly dad. Because of your son, Jesus, who opened the door. He's the way maker. He provided the way back to you. You sent him. And thank you for his life and death on a cross and for his resurrection and his continuing ministry and the gift of the Holy Spirit now that you've placed within us. Thank you for your word. Written so long ago, yet so relevant for us today. Help us, Lord. We choose to be godly. We choose to train ourselves to live a godly life, to believe the right things, to conduct ourselves the right way. Lord, for any here who are struggling in this area, that they need to throw away some things. They need to flee from some false beliefs and wrong practices. Help them now. Help us to embrace, to pursue what's right and true and to fight for the faith and to practice liberality and to, be, to, to become godly like you, to reflect your nature. Bless every person. For any who don't know Jesus as their saviour, help them. If they're standing here in this place, help them to reach out to him even now and to say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I give you my sin. I receive your forgiveness. I give you my past I receive a new beginning. Lord Jesus, change my life. Enable me now. Lord, answer their prayers. Move upon their hearts. And for all of us, help us to align ourselves to what you say in your word. Touch every heart. Touch every life. Touch every man, every woman, every parent, every brother, every sister. May your word produce fruit, seed that will just produce a great crop in the lives of hundreds, if not thousands of people. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.